Hey, welcome to my show. I'm Schnoodlebug. This is a DIY podcast about making stuff no matter what. As always, this episode is brought to you by Schnoodle Video. Hey, are you in need of an editor? Schnoodle Video offers professional short form edits of long form content like live streams and IRL events. For examples of their work, check out schnoodlevideo.com or hit the link in the show notes. Louis Kyoto is a music producer and engineer who owns and operates Starfish House, his one-man recording studio out of an office building based near Boston. But you might recognize him as Starfish Death Squad, the online noise beat maker who accidentally damaged his drum machine but figured out how to spin it into viral video gold. I got to talk to Louis mere months after his song of the summer bait and switch blew up online. Um, so like when I was little, I loved, uh, Lincoln Park, Green Day, uh, and Good Charlotte. Those were like my three favorite bands ever. And then, um, when I got into middle school and I went on the internet and people, people told me that those bands are basic and I, you know, it totally got in my head at the time. I was like, no way. Like, I, I like, my, like, these are my favorite bands. How can they be bad? Like. Just because, you know, I'm just reading some random comments on the internet, you know what I mean? But so then in, in like sixth grade, in like 2011, um, I was like, all right, I'm going to start listening to like math rock. And at the time, I, I didn't, didn't really like get it. But then like I actually learned to count and like count music, you know, like even play along. And then, I, you know, at that point, it started like really clicking with me, making a lot of sense to me. And, Remains one of my like my favorite genres to this day, but I was also you know in between uh, like 2013 and 2016, just like the like the internet musical underground that was kind of occurring at that time was really, really what um, like inspired me to make music. You know, that's what I would really consider at this point to be like my full time job is you know that's why I make the money that supports me and what I do right now is having people into my studio where I am right now and where I record all my videos and I just I record their songs and I produce their songs I, I make beats for them as well like arrange and mix stuff like a little mastering but I don't really consider myself to be like a mastering engineer it's a whole other can of worms that I'm not ready to open yet oh man it's kind of a complicated story because I started this during the pandemic Right. And so I was, I was actually living off of pandemic unemployment money because I, my previous jobs had ended due to the, due to the pandemic. Um, so I used that money to essentially start the studio over COVID. Right. So I kind of got an, a crazy opportunity there that, um, you know, I, I guess I just kind of got lucky, you know what I mean? With the situation I was in at the time. So, but yeah, without, without that, I wouldn't really have been able to start the studio it was kind of almost like seed funding um and i was definitely really stupid about it for a while um and not really like even trying to like market myself and work with new people and whatnot but over the past few years those are like skills that i've developed for sure and i'm right you know at this point thinking about it much more like a business rather than um just like having a studio Mm -hmm. I have a degree in sound recording technology from UMass Lowell. They had a pretty good program there. They had really nice facilities, actually. They had, like, like three different big format analog consoles and then multiple, like, control rooms and recording studios, which was pretty cool. I certainly used a lot of the stuff I learned there, but it was definitely more geared, at least at that point, towards uh, recording bands. Uh, that's, not, that's not what's, at least at my level, what sells, you know what I mean? Right. I guess not, that's not the people who are trying to come in to record with me. I work with a lot of um, vocalists, usually. Yeah, so I've got a few different rappers and singers that I work with, essentially. I, at that time, was uh, planning to apply for internships in New York City at recording studios. Um, and obviously, I didn't get to do that uh, because of COVID. So I really had no other choice other than to just start my own studio. And it's... It's been totally worth it, and I've loved every minute, uh, despite being very anxious for some of those minutes. I messed around and made a couple beats in high school, but just for fun. It was really once I had left high school and I was already had signed up for the sound recording program uh, in college, 
So I was like, well, I better start recording something. I'm going to study this. So that's when I started making my own music. It was like when I was like 18, right after high school. I've always been playing instruments like my whole life. And I started playing guitar when I was like 12, I think. I got into uh, like messing around with guitar pedals in high school. And I would go on Reddit and I would like trade them with other people and like trade up stuff. And that's actually how I got all the pedals on my pedal board that I have today. And so that kind of, you know, at least inspired me to turn knobs. I also had a guitar teacher at the time named Doug. He had his own studio as well. And so I saw him and I was like, I want to do that. You know what I mean? Right. Be able to record whatever I want. He had this big, giant, like, shed in his backyard almost. And it was just, like, like really high ceilings. And, like, there was a big live room and then a control room separated with, like, class and then yeah he i think he was recording on tape but then he had the like tape going into pro tools something like that some old school stuff yeah at the time um i was really into like like in the 2010s like stuff that was coming out in the underground then like i love death grips and like clipping and so they were definitely big inspirations for just like fucking with audio in, in the most like in the rawest possible form absolutely you know which I think that's what they do so well. Those kinds of bands got me interested in, in the production side of things, especially the experimental stuff. And then, of course, I love like um, like noise and like heavy like metal stuff, like Boris and Merzbau, like those kinds of artists. I discovered them around that time as well. I, at that time, it's just like it's so much fun to like just show someone who's never heard of that before. You know what I mean? I remember like listening to Linkin Park like in the car when I was four. You know? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So it's like it's always been in the back of my mind somewhere. Absolutely. I know for a fact that I had paper cut on my like original iPod Shuffle that was like literally a USB stick with a yeah. play button. That was, that was a game changer growing up because before I had that, I had the portable CD player. When when did you start messing around with drum machines? I think honestly, I started messing around with drum machines when I got this one, which was, I think, in, like, 2017. And it wasn't broken when I got it, but I was definitely learning how to mess around with the effects in the same way that I do now. So, but then when I started trying to record it a lot, that was when I, like, fucked it up and broke it. How did that happen? It was, this was a few years ago. So as far as I remember... I plugged the output directly into my focus right, which has combo jacks. Right. And I, I turned on the phantom power and it fucking like spazzed. And I may or may not have turned it off at that point, which could have been what did it. But then after all of that, everything was completely scrambled, but it still, it still works. So what, I, what I've come to deduce about it is that I think just that, the smart media card itself, that which is you know where all the memory samples are stored, whatever that stuff is all that's corrupted, right? But the drum machine itself like works fine on the inside, except for like maybe a loose connection near the output. I, I definitely initially I was like fuck, like I paid two hundred dollars for this, like, <laughs> but then I, as I realized that it was actually going to continue working, yeah, right. It's like total like noise and i think actually the first thing that i did was i recorded all of the stock loops as they sounded with the corruption i like tried to make beats in the daw with those loops essentially right. uh and that was a few years ago i don't think those like turned out very well that's not as that's not as fun as having the tactile experience of playing with the electribe itself and more recently i did i recorded like loops from this into the computer specifically for making beats with and then I released that and I'm selling that as a sample pack now. Yeah, as as soon as the first reel that like went off went off, I put out an, an EP like a couple of days later. Smart. And also <laughs> right. And also like because I mean people were literally asking, like, is, is there anything out? Can I listen to this anywhere? <laughs> the answer should be yes. So let me just I I made the EP and then I also made the sample pack. Because, you know, I realized that the samples are really what's unique about this drum machine. And I can literally record that package and sell it. Uh, it's a good bit of pocket change. It definitely directly correlates with how much I'm advertising it on Instagram. 
every once in a while, I'll go back and be like, I made a beat with my sample pack and my loop pack. Or, you know, I the original ad, which I'm sure you've seen, is the one where I tell the story of, of the drum machine. That's the one that I did the best, for sure. It was either, I think it was, it was, oh no, it was actually, it was the middle of July this year. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, at that time I had 500 followers and now I'm at like uh, over 9,000, which is awesome. Unreal. It was different from everything that I'd done up until that point. And then once that one uh, sort of took off, I, I tried to model all the other ones after that one, essentially. And that's worked very well for me. Uh, same punchline, different setup is kind of the, the tactic. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and for me, at least, it came with a little bit of anxiety where I'm like, you know, okay, I, I know that this stream of followers, even though it's, an, and really stream of engagement that's, that I'm getting right now, like I know it's going to taper off eventually, but I just don't know when. And I don't, I, at the time, don't necessarily know how to keep it going for sure, you know? So I just kind of had to keep trying things. Did you have any influences in terms of, uh, or, or other accounts you were following where you're like, okay, these are my North stars, my kind of guiding light. I'm going to use these as examples of what I want to do. So the, the first reel that went viral for me, which was the, it was me sitting with the guitar and I said, I think I just wrote the song of the summer and then it cuts to the noise. That was like, I like previously that day had watched a Dev Lemons video where she was talking about that trend. And I was like, oh, like this is a perfect like opportunity for me to make this stupid joke. And then it took off from there. So I think she, like she, her and the Queef Jerky account, they're great for stealing trends from. <laughs> That's how I stay on top of shit is watching their stuff. Cause I, sometimes I feel right. so out of the loop, especially with stuff like TikTok. Do you, uh, do you also post yeah. to TikTok? I do post on TikTok, but I don't browse TikTok at yeah. all. Honestly. I really just post and then interact with people in my comments. I don't really do much else on TikTok. Yeah, I, I still I only have like a thousand followers right now on TikTok. So the Instagram is doing much better, which is interesting because since the Instagram initially went off, I've had like multiple posts on TikTok do well. But it seems that I don't the, like my account itself won't maintain any momentum from the posts. Rather on Instagram, if I get a lot of engagement on one post, that tends to seem to... Um, like translate or, you know, run off into the other posts that I make. But on TikTok, it's like, oh, uh, you know, one will get 56K views and then I'll post one the next day and it gets 300 views. Right. And that on Instagram doesn't really happen, at least to me. I don't know. It feels more I like still... you have an, a, a group that you're kind of catering to as opposed to kind of just throwing things out in the wild and hoping for the best yeah, for that algorithm. I, which is something that I still do not understand. I don't know if anyone really does. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I, I think you do a really awesome job of, on a front-facing level, you take a lot of the negative comments that you get, and you just straight up share them on your stories, which I really appreciate. Yeah. And, you know, put a few laughing emojis or something underneath or a wry comment. <laughs> so did that come naturally, or was that something where at first, you know, you have suddenly a bunch of eyeballs on you, a lot of comments all of a sudden, uh, good and bad. Was that kind of uh, shocking at first or something that you had to deal with or did you kind of just come to that right away? Uh, that's a good question. I feel like, you know, with the nature of the music and everything, it's kind of, I kind of expect to get those comments. And I kind of have the philosophy that like, if I'm not getting hater comments, then I need to change up what I'm doing. Uh, do something more controversial that will get more people talking. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, because they like they like when some i've had people like like start an argument in one of my posts and then it turns into like you know a 200 comment long thread and that's like you know that's great for my for my like engagement metrics you know what i mean yeah. so i love that but like the like the words them themselves is like whatever 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 it is about the, like anonymity and the internet makes people just like like just say things that they wouldn't say like Maybe it's something that they think, but they don't like, they wouldn't, you know, people, I think they feel more free to express themselves 
and just say whatever's on their mind. And it just the way it comes out sometimes is like, I think it's really funny. And a lot of the times, like when I share a comment, like a hater comment specifically on my story, like it'll like not only just be a hater comment, but it's usually something that I also legitimately thought was funny. You know, like, like I, I, I yesterday someone was like, it sounds like when I take a dump and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, what? well, I mean, I, keep like all of my notifications off on my phone Smart. pretty much except for like texts so that way i can at least like just check it when i want it's like now that i have that stream of engagement that we were talking about earlier it's like i'm sort of i'm just trying to keep that going and keep that keep that flowing you know okay like i've gotten used to the sort of volume of uh sort of like notifications when, when i'll open instagram right. you know what i mean yeah. And it's like, if it's more, if it's more, if it's more, then it's more. If it's less, then it's less. And I'll know that. And if it's less, I'll post more. And if it's more, then um, I'll usually, you know, like take a break and take a day off or something. I'm posting. I'm managing rather than like letting it control me. That's really healthy. Was that something that you did right from the start? Or did you have to learn that? I definitely had to do some figuring out because... You know, at the start, when it, when it, you know, that one one video in, in July, it, that I think ended up getting like 500k plays. That one was like after that one, I was like, oh man, like what do I do? What do I do? And then so I started doing the remixes, like when I couldn't think of any other content to make, um, and that kind of sort of became a really good like baseline where it's like if I don't have like a meme to post or or some some other like hot idea that I have, then I'll I'll throw up a remix. Yeah. And because, you know, I'm never going to run out of good songs to remix. I have a very long list of uh, requests <laughs> I'm trying to get to. But I also, I want to do songs that I know will do well, you know? So it's like, it's tough when someone requests a remix for like a really niche song. Right. And it's like, I want to do it. But at the same time, I also want to do like an Ice Spice song because I know that it, people will go crazy for that, you know? Uh, a lot of the times I'll just either use AI or um, use one that's already been ripped on YouTube. There are, there are a few ones that I've actually gotten the, the vocal stems for, but a lot of the times it's just AI isolation. Oh, interesting. Cause, okay. Because it's like, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to put that much effort into the reels. You know what I mean? And yeah. I, I truly believe that if you do put too much effort into them, then they won't do well. Yeah. You know, so it's like I try not to sweat the small stuff like that, like a hundred Gex um, and Death Grips for at least for their first album have released their stems like on their websites, uh, you know, specifically for stuff like this, which is so awesome. Freaking love them for that. So like for I did a remix of the Wear, and I think I did, I did Bunny Machine. And so for those, I had the actual like vocal stems, but I think pretty much everything else is straight like ripped from YouTube. I think that's one of the things that's been lost in this, in like the digital and the streaming age is like having a, a B side of a single that has a, like an instrumental isolated vocal, uh, like, and then maybe like stems or, you know, like, which, you know, they would put that out so that people could make remixes. And now it's like, yeah, they either put, put stems out on the website or it's not really a good way to get it out to people like that. I think around the, like a couple months ago, I had a couple people, when, when they saw the Instagram initially kind of go up, uh, they hit me up like, hey, let's do a session. But um, I haven't I haven't really had like had a, like a new uh, like repeat client come in. Right. Really. I guess I'm, I'm still working with a lot of the same people from before that. But it is it's only been a few months at this point. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. And where is your space? 30 minutes north of Boston, kind of in the middle of suburbs. It's, I'm actually in an office building, and oh, okay. so I'm only allowed after hours on the weekend. So it's there's pros and cons to being here for sure. But it's nice to kind of be in the middle of kind of nowhere, um, where there's like you know buildings around, but like the house across the street like has chickens, and like a, like a, a little a big garden, and then you know the nearest business if we go down the road is a farm. Right. And we have a farm stand. We can get like apple cider donuts and apple cider. And it's awesome. 
a little bit of a different sleep schedule than I would say most people. I wake up late, go to bed late. But that's because if I'm doing a session, people don't really tend to want to do a session at like 9 a.m. anyways. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm trying to think if I've actually ever done a 9 a.m. session. Yeah, people are working. Um, a lot of musicians too, especially. So, yeah. As a teenager, I didn't really, but more recently, I've been going to more shows. Yeah. Actually, one of the first shows that, that was like really awesome that I went to was I saw Swans at the Royale in Boston with like all of my friends from high school in, in like 2016. And that was the first like, because we had all just turned 18 and, you know, our bands that we liked played 18 plus or 21 plus venues. So that was like the first like real concert we got to go to together and it was really awesome. We'll always remember that one. Well, I was going to say, it's a funny coincidence. Uh, I got a swan shirt with the um, the filth uh, mouth on it. You know, the classic swan shirt at that concert. And then that was the shirt that I was wearing in the video. Um, that was the first one to go viral on my Instagram. Very cool. Full circle. So cool. <laughs> um, just like finding a... A, like loyal base of clients that you can get to come back regularly. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be like a giant group of people. You know, you can um, like, I, I was paying my rent for a long time with like, just like uh, six to 10 people, like different clients coming regularly and, you know, people come and go and move and all that stuff. So the other thing is doing actual sales and reaching out to people, which sucks and I hate it and it's the worst part. Um, but like, you, you just have to put yourself out there like that, you know? Um, and the other, the third thing is like, literally keeping track of like everything, like the money that is going in and out essentially, you know, doing all that paperwork. And even, even if it's like, you know you're good or you think you're good or whatever, just like keeping closer track of that, keep taking all that stuff seriously, keeping the space clean. That's I know people with studios who have trouble with that. I've sent cold DMs on Instagram, uh, but I haven't I haven't really cold called uh, or, or cold emailed anyone. Yeah, I, I hate I hate doing that stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's it's like a necessary evil. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, that's how you hit me up and that's how we got here, right? And the outcome is totally worth it in the end. But it just it sucks to do. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure you know. You can follow Lewis through the links in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening to The Schnoodlebuck Show. Spread the word, tell your friends, and go make stuff. you mind if I do like a roll call of shout outs at the end of the video? Dude, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Uh, shout out that boy solo shout out willie d uh shout out flow shout out ohm shout out dame and by flow i mean flow 1810 sorry that's important flow 1810 myself starfish death squad uh on spotify streaming and also uh underscore forward slash equals satan equals backslash underscore 3333 on streaming that's the noise beats which are fucking great <laughs>